to sorting out and the benefits of sorting out. And when eventually, you know, he put it together. And like I shared with some of you before we started it, I, I, even though he had told me a lot about sorting out and, you know, the intricacies and the consequences and the benefits of sorting out, I was still a bit tentative about it. I had to ask a friend of mine, I said, do you think this thing really works? You know, Pastor Agu Jesus has London. He said, Joe, this thing works. It really, really works. You know, and we got to it. And uh, I, I went through sorting out myself uh, two years ago when he did it first in Atlanta. And um, this year he came back and we have, how many of you here were able to attend the sorting out? How many of you? Come on, was it, was it a good program or not? It was, it was awesome. So, yeah, he's, he's been here all week ministering and that's what they've been doing. You know, my, my wife, when she got sorted out, you know, so <laughs> yeah. combination of sorted at home, you know, so uh, it's something that will be done over the years and um, down the road. And I want to encourage you in advance that this is something you really would like to prepare for and uh, get involved in. Um, this morning, he's here with his wife, you know, so. <laughs> So we're, we're happy to have you, man. You're very welcome. Very welcome to this place. Um, Reverend Joe has ministered in this church so many times, and he'll continue to minister so many times until Jesus comes. Uh, you didn't say that to me properly. Yeah. Yeah. So he'll minister. When eventually we buy the private jet, it'll be easy. We'll, we'll bring him here. Let him know. Yeah. Yeah. So without much ado, it's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to bring you to the podium, Reverend Joe Laya, a man God has raised for a season. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lift up your right hand and say, Jesus, I love you. Say it from your heart, Jesus, I love you. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship you. Thank you that we are not lost. And we are not deceived unto some dumb idols. But we are worshiping you who made us. We are the sheep of your pasture. You also made the heavens and the earth. All the entire universe is the work of your hand. We are grateful. Thank you that you are our God. You are our Father. You are our King. You are our Sustainer. You are our Provider. You are our Shepherd. You are our Defender. You are our Deliverer. You are our Redeemer. You are our Savior. You are everything to us. It is in you we live and move and have our being. We thank you. We thank you. Receive our praise. Receive our worship. Receive our adoration. Thank you for dwelling among us. Thank you for taking your place in our praise. Thank you for humbling yourself to come in among us. We are grateful. Thank you, Heavenly Father. This morning again, send your word to us. Recreate us. Renew us. Revive us. Restore us. Do everything you want to do in our lives. And Father, the rest of our days and our years, we shall leave it to your praise. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. God bless you. It's been a wonderful weekend here in Atlanta. The weather has been extremely very good. And my judgment coming down from Birmingham and I know that I had to do some self-control and self-protection against cold but you know but it's just been fine over here Amen I guess that's where many of you are living in Atlanta I think I'll post you to Canada <laughs> Praise the Lord um, This morning the Lord will really bless you. And I don't want you to be absent-minded. I want you to be present, spirit, soul, and body. I know your body is already seated here, but I want your mind. I want your emotions. I want your thoughts. 
I want your heart to really, really be here. The reason I'm making this request is God works by his word. And that word has to gain entrance into you for it to work for you. In fact, Jesus lamented concerning the Jews when he said, Isaiah is right on what he has declared concerning you, that in hearing, you hear, but you don't understand. You see, but you don't perceive. It's a blindness that's happened to them that they may not hear and understand, that they may not be converted, that they may not be healed. So hearing from the inside is very, very important. Say to yourself, my heart is open. I will truly hear God. I will pay attention. And I will be blessed. Amen. I'll take the scripture reading from Hebrews chapter 2. We'll read from verse 1 to verse 15. author did not really identify himself. It is popularly accepted among Bible scholars that is an epistle of Paul. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have had, lest at any time we should let them slip. I'm reading from the King James Version. For if the word spoken by angels was testified as an Every transgression and disobedience receive a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that had him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Verse 5. For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, wherefore we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? Thou makest him a little lower than the angels. Thou canest him with glory and honor. And this certainly were the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Verse 10. For it became him, for who by all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call their brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are particles of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. 15, the last verse. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. May the Lord bless the reading of his words. This morning I will bring the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to you in a way that I believe is going to become very clear and plain to you so that you can make a proper decision and then get the benefits of the gospel. The gospel means good news, glad tidings as brought by our Lord 
Jesus Christ. What is this gospel? Here the Apostle Paul said, how will we escape if we neglect the message which came to us through our Lord Jesus Christ? So how do we escape if we neglect that message? He said, the earlier message that came through angels was steadfast. And every disobedience, transgression, rebellion, or rejection of that message met, received a just recompense. That means those who despised the message, rebelled against the message, suffered instantly. So how shall we escape even the, the, the great salvation, the good news of salvation, which the Lord himself from heaven brought down to us one that is superior to the angels. If you read the previous chapter of Hebrews, chapter 1, he compares the angels to Jesus and, and reveals that the angels have no basis to stand by his side. In fact, he said it is commanded, let all angels worship him. If angels brought messages and people despised them, suffered, and they receive instant punishment. He said, how will you escape if the message of salvation, the good news brought by Jesus Christ, one whom the angels have instruction to worship? He said, the consequence for neglecting that salvation, for despising it, for playing around with it, for not taking advantage of it, the consequences will be great. He said, God even went ahead and bore witness to that message with diverse miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his will. When angels spoke, they probably brought one or two signs, but when Jesus brought his message, he brought multiple signs. From the time of his exposure, of being in Cana of Galilee, where a wedding was there, was on, and one of his cousins' wedding, and there, suddenly they ran out of drinks and it was becoming embarrassing as per the culture of that time that when you have guests in your wedding, they should all be taken care of. And to save the family from that embarrassment, the mother walked to him and said, son, we have an embarrassing situation developing. Please step in. And he said, mom, why are you bothering me? I'm not to start public works yet. And the mother turned to the disciples and said, whatever he tells you, do. He turned around and said, look, for my mom, I will do this. Um, fill the jars with water. And they filled the jars with water in John chapter 2. And he said, take out of it, serve the chairman of the feast. He turned out to be very sweet wine, high quality, the best quality wine they ever tasted. Who is this man who has the answer to every situation? He was unruffled, and he always knew what to do. The same man began to minister, and the crowds talked to him. For upward of three days, they would not go anywhere, and they had no food to eat, and they weren't bothered. What was the holding power that men gathered around and listened from morning till evening for three days without finding time to go and eat. Jesus now said, the meeting is over. And they said, all right. Then Jesus said, it is not good to send these people away hungry. They might be fainting on the way. Find something for them to eat. One of the disciples said, if we shut down the bakeries around, we will not have enough provisions for them. The crowd is huge. Jesus said, find them something to eat. A little child hearing about their discussion on food offered his breakfast or lunch pack to one of the disciples. If the master wants to eat, let him have some lunch. 
just taking it over, blessed him, and said, sit them out, in, sit them down in fifties. They made them, in, they set them up in groups of fifties, and before long, little Charles Joe Fast had seven baskets extra after feeding 5,000. Who is this man who on his way was beckoned upon by one of the religious leaders called Jairus? And Jairus said to him, Master, my daughter is dying at home. Please come quickly. Lay hands on me to stop the sickness from taking the bigger. And Jesus said, I'll come. On his way, a woman created a scene. She went secretly behind and touched his bed. And she said, I got it. Jesus suddenly stopped and turned to her and said, somebody touched me. Who did? And I can hear Peter saying, you did. The crowd is pressing. They push us, so we press on you. He said, so if you start to touch, it must be from one of us. Jesus said, no. Your own touch had no meaning at all. Somebody touched me with an intention because something left my body. Who did? Turning Stanley and looking at the woman, he had identified her, but he gave her the opportunity to identify herself. He fixed the gaze on her, and the woman trembling, fearing that she had done something unlawful, brought the story out. She's been a woman that had had issue of blood for 12 years. And I've been to many physicians and I lost everything and suffered many things in their hands and was not better. But she said that as soon as she touched him, she felt virtue going into her and the bleeding stopped. So she came with a mission. The mission was to touch him secretly and get healed. Jesus did that. I said, Chair of daughter, your faith made you whole. I have no business with this healing. I didn't know you were coming. I didn't organize it. All I knew that something left me. Your faith made you whole. While they were about concluding that, a messenger comes from the nobleman's house and said, don't bother the prophet anymore. Leave him alone. Your daughter died before I left home. <laughs> and the man's face changed. Jesus Christ turned to him and said, fear not. Don't change your mind. Your daughter lives. Who is this man? that is unruffled by the announcement of death, not shaken, but speaks with every calmness and assurance. He goes in there, finds that people are wailing, and says, get this from mourner's house. So why are you making so much noise? The girl is only sleeping. Who is this man that refers to death as sleep? And the mourners mocked him, says, what does he mean? What does he, who does he think he is? We certified somebody dead, and he's saying the person is sleeping. Don't we know the difference between sleep and death? How old is he? So we are old women. We've seen so many people dying. The girl is dying. So let's wait for him to wake her from the sleep. And so they walked away and waited a while. Then suddenly, from inside, from hushed discussion, Jesus saying, find something for her to eat, and walks out. So, but don't noise this, just keep it to yourself. How do you keep that to yourself? The news already went into the entire neighborhood that the girl had died. Now, the girl is sitting and having some breakfast, and you are saying, keep this to yourself. So Jesus walks out, and he said, he said the girl was sleeping. So where is she? We thought he got out, and then the mother rushes out of the bed, goes to look for something. What are you doing? What about the girl? He said, if you say nothing about it, I'm just getting some things ready for her. So what about her? He says nothing about it. What happened? He said, it was just wonderful. He went inside and said, Tali Takumi. And the girl sat up. He said, really, can we see her? He said, no. He doesn't want anybody to know about it. Please keep this to yourself. 
And that person spy looks in and said, the girl was sitting, taking some, having some breakfast. Then that one goes back and says, what's the situation? He doesn't want anybody to know about this. So what is it? I saw the girl sitting down. She's eating. Can I get a piece? He doesn't want anybody to know about it. And he goes quite around the town. Before then, he had gone to the post of the Gentiles because he had an urgency in his spirit that somebody was in a desperate situation. A man that had defied Taman and, and chains, defied imprisonment, defied, defied incarceration. You couldn't tie him down. You couldn't lock him up. He would break every door, break every window, break every chain, break every fetter, break every iron. slept in the tombs. Never really slept. Day and night he would go up and down shouting, wailing, crying up, down, up, down, up, down and tearing himself. Blood streaming down. Day and night. Jesus had not just seen the spirit that there was a man He was on the coast of the Gentiles. He was not a Jew. And Jesus went after him. The demon saw Jesus. There were 6,000 in number. And Jesus sent them out. They demanded of Jesus that he should let them go into the pigs around. And there were 2,000 in number. And they took over the pigs. And the pig said, we will not, we will not, we will not keep these fellows. We will rather commit suicide and keep these fellows. And those 6,000 spirits that troubled one man could not, could not, could not be accepted by 2,000 pigs. They preferred to go down into the sea and to drown than remain the habitation of those evil spirits. Yet one man man's life and destiny was totally upturned by this evil spirit. Jesus set him free. So much that the people from his city came and appealed to him. They said, our major business here is people. Big sir, we appreciate that you have set the man free, but we'll lose all our business. So don't bother to come into our town. The man appealed to Jesus to follow Jesus. Jesus said, go back and tell them what great things God has done for you. Who is this man that thousands of evil spirits obey his instruction? He went to the pool of Bethesda, a pool that was set apart by God, the fragment of his mercy, to a backslidden nation who had forgotten God. That once in a season that is not regular, not regulated, and not defined, at the time the God, the Almighty God chooses, one angel comes and he steers the pool. And the first person to get into the pool after the steering gets healed. Only one person. Then we wait for another season again. And the timing is not good. So around the pool were a great number of impotent foes, paralyzed afflicted, tormented, tortured. And people are spending days and weeks and months and years and it's not certain when the next visitation will be. There was a man who had been there for 38 years. As if he had become the chairman of the Important Folks Association of the Pool of Bethesda. He was known. His case was very pathetic. He was paralyzed from his shoulder down. Totally paralyzed. Now try to lie down on one spot for one week and see how you feel. I guess the man's body had started decaying while he was alive. For 38 years, he had no mobility. Everybody abandoned him. He lost his identity. Jesus walks into that territory and looks at the man. He said, do you want to be made whole? He said, that's why I'm here. My problem is that I have no man. I can count the number of times the angel has been here in the last 38 years. 
And every time I make effort to go down, because I have no man to push me into the water, somebody gets in before me. And so that person takes the healing. But I know one day, one day, I will get in first. But that was his day. This is not an angel steering the water, but one man. An angel with all the anointing he carries from the presence of God gets only one person healed in a sleeping. Jesus said to him, rise up, roll up your bed, and go home. It was a Sabbath day. That was very offensive to the religious Jews. Because in their understanding, healing is a great work, and no work should be done on the Sabbath, even though it's a holy work. And Jesus wondered and said to them, on the Sabbath day, do you not release your oxen and your donkeys to go and feed and to go and have water? Anyway, the man was healed. I guess when he got back to his territory, nobody recognized him. The decay, the paralysis, everything was gone. His flesh was renewed. The nervous system, the flesh, the bone, the blood. I don't understand. Who is this man whose word gets people up? He entered into Genesaret and they recognized him in, Saint Luke, in Matthew chapter 14. Verse 34 to 36. They recognized him and they said, Master, we recognize you. Don't bother doing anything. Just just stay one point. We'll bring all the sick out. And as they brought them out, everybody who touched him got healed. Now, this is the man who brought the gospel with signs and wonders. Then he began to send out his disciples. And they began to do the same thing. If we neglect his message, what is his message? His message, the Son of Man did not come to be ministered to. But the Son of Man came that he might give his life to minister and to give his life a ransom. That is the message. He came to give his life a ransom. A ransom is a price you pay for life. You pay on a human head. When somebody is held and they say, we'll not release him until you pay a price. That is a special price for the release of man. It's called a ransom. He said, the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom. Why give his life a ransom? Because we are all sold out. Our great father Adam am sold over. He disobeyed God. He lost dominion. He lost control. And we are in his loins. He sold us out. We got into trouble. We are sold to sin. The scripture says anyone that commits sin is a servant of sin. That's what Jesus said. He sold us unto sin. He sold us unto the devil. Jesus said, to the Jews that were religious but they were sinners, said, you're of your father the devil. The lust of your father you do. He was a liar from the beginning. That's in St. John chapter 8, verse 44. Adam sold us out. In St. John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Implying that we're in bondage. The Jews said, we are not in bondage. He said, you don't know what you are saying. He said, we are sons of Abraham. He said, Whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. Are you a sinner? Then you are a servant. You are a slave of sin. And we know that the slave does not abide in the house. He will work for a while and then he will be sacked. The sons abide forever in the house. So, but if the son shall set you free, you will be free indeed. And what was he saying? At that time, there was a custom that sons, legitimate sons, could change the status of slaves legitimate son could look at a slave born in the house and change his status, adopt the slave and make him a child. So Jesus said, if the son will set you free, you will be free indeed. Now this Jesus Christ is the legitimate son of God. How was his conception? How did he come into the world? He is the word of God personified. He took up a body in Mary and was conceived in Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he is a child of the Holy Ghost. He is called the Son of the Most High. So when he came down into the earth and found that we had become slaves, as a matter of fact, he came because we had been enslaved. He came to make us sons. And that's why the scripture says in St. John chapter 1, he came unto his own and his own. No, he was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Then in verse 12, he says, St. John chapter 1, But as many as received him, he now gave them the right of sonship. Power! 
authority to become strong. So that's why he came. That's the message. But for you to become a son, a price has to be paid. He said his life he will give us a ransom. He says, scarcely will you find somebody that will agree to die for a good man. But for a sinner he came. So while we are yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He came and offered his life. This is the love of God for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And anyone who recognizes that he's been a sinner and does not want to face the consequence of his sin and will want to be absolved, set free, justified, forgiven, delivered from the whole of sin and the consequence of the sins. Such person, if such person will believe that Jesus gave his life a ransom, because the law is that the soul that sins shall die. Death was never part of the program. Sin brought him death. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, death passed upon all men beginning from Adam. Even over those who did not sin in the pattern of Adam. As long as you are born of Adam, death passed upon all men. So death reigned from Adam to Moses. Reigned on church. Death became, death took dominion. Man was given dominion. Sin and death took over dominion. Satan is the organizer of death. Is the one that has the authority of death. As we read in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. He had the power of death and held everybody captive. Now because we were in captivity, the son had to come. And the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. That he by the grace of God should taste death. For every man. How will he taste death for billions of people? Will he die over and over and over for each one, turn by turn? No. Simple statistics. We all are the offspring of Adam. So tasting death for Adam covers everybody. Now, it is not automatic. It must be individually appreciated, appropriated, acknowledged. While he has died, and made his death available for all mankind as long as you are an offspring of Adam. Each Adam's child will on his own, personally, individually, appropriate that ransom, that redemption, that price, that deliverance, personally, by accepting, by believing, by agreeing that Jesus actually took his place to die. Now, the law of dying is simple. The soul that sinned, it shall die. It's sin that makes you vulnerable to death. If you don't sin, you don't die. We have it in the scripture that Jesus never sinned. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he said, He made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness. The scripture confirmed that he knew no sin. Even his critics said to him when they asked them in the Gospels, Why do you want to kill me? What sin have I done? They said, not because of any sin, but because you call yourself the son of God. So Jesus did not commit any sin. In his 33 and a half years of being on earth, he never sinned. Every other man that I know has come into the world committed sin. Acquired sin, was a sinner by nature, was a sinner by birth, I was a sinner by practice, by experience. Now, by birth, Jesus was not a sinner because he was not conceived of the seed of Adam. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. The blood of Jesus was not contaminated with the sin that is in your blood and my blood. How? Because not until an egg is fertilized, he brings forth no life. The seed that fertilizes the egg for the human comes from the man. No man slept with Mary. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. So the life that was in the body of Jesus Christ when he was born is not from the blood of Adam. It's directly from God. That life in his blood came directly from God. It was free of the contamination of sin. And when he was born, he had no experience of sin. So by birth, he was not a sinner. By experience and by life, 
first time he was never a sinner. So why then did he die? Since death is only applicable, whether physical or spiritual death, it is only applicable to those who have sinned. If you have not sinned, you are not vulnerable to death. Why did he die? There are two ways to be guilty by actually committing the offense or by acquiring the offense. He became guilty by acquisition. If you go to stand for somebody that you should be bailed out and you give the guarantee and you make yourself the shorty, what have you done? You have brought yourself onto the same pedestal. You better make sure the guy doesn't escape because if the guy escaped, who was guilty? So Jesus became guilty by taking our place, by standing shorty for us. He acquired our sin. He wasn't just taking us out on bail so that he could take us back. No. He was saying, I am taking over their guilt. I want them to be free. So you go out free. Don't come back here. I'll go to jail for you. I'll pay the price. So he accepted our guilt. That's what the scripture says. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. I want you to know it. And before then, nobody could kill Jesus. Nobody could hurt Jesus. Nobody could harm Jesus. Nobody could arrest Jesus. Nobody could bind Jesus. I, I checked it through the scriptures. I saw several attempts made by his enemies. They, they couldn't do anything to him. Because he had not seen. He was not vulnerable to death. That's why he could walk on water. He couldn't see. I dare to tell you that if Jesus got into fire to get you out, while your dress may be burnt, your hands may be burnt, he will have no smoke. Not as little as some smoke on his dress. Don't you, see, don't you see what happened when he got into the fairy furnace with the three Hebrew boys? His presence suspended the fierceness and the violence of the flames. The flames could not violate them because he was there. The storm couldn't violate him because he was at sea with them. He walked on water. Think about it. Those were terrible situations. He could have died. He could have drowned. He walked on water and took them to safety. On one occasion, they arrested him in the gospel according to St. Luke. I think chapter 4. Because he told them in his city, Nazareth, he said, you guys cannot get anything because a prophet, no prophet is without honor except in his village. You will say to me, you have said to me, show the miracles. He said, there were many lepers in Israel. Not one of them was healed. But Naaman, the Syrian, a Gentile, a pagan, came from a great distance and he got healed. See, there were many widows in Israel. Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to the widow of Zarephath, because of the unbelief of Israelites. He said, so they have no portion in it. Strangers are coming in and getting the blessings. He said, what are you saying to us? He said, yes, you cannot get a portion in this because you are not believing. You are questioning. You are telling me, show us. They said, all right, we now know you have a devil. We're going to kill you. They arrested him, and they will take him and throw him down the steep hill. And he walked with them and walked out of their hands while they were still going. They got to the teeth and they said, where is he? You are holding him. You are holding him. What had happened? Jesus said, no man can take my life. I lay it down. I take it again. If you don't understand, let me bring that to your understanding. It was at a time when there was threat to arrest him. He was saying, deploy an army. No army can take my life. Bring your swords. And he proved it in Gates men. When, he, when they came and they said, he said, who do you look for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. What happened? The scripture records this St. John that they fell. They went backwards. When he said, I am. An invisible force pushed them and they fell backwards. The man is not a subject of death because he had never seen. Why then did he die? Why did he die? I bet you. 
Put your gun on him and shoot him several bullets. You will collect your bullets and then back to you. Why did he die? There was a battle in the Garden of Gethsemane. There was a cup. That was the place where he was to acquire the sin of Adam. Adam and Eve fell in a garden. The exchange was done in the garden. It was food they ate that brought the downfall of mankind. So in another garden, Jesus took the cup and acquired the sin of Adam. In spite of that, he still had power not to die because he was never a sinner by experience. When he acquired that sin, he will voluntarily lay down his life. The disciples never believed that anybody would be able to arrest him. Even Judas didn't believe that he could be made subject to death because they've been with him several times and they have seen that death had no hold or power on him. Remember that a few days before now, he was at the grave of Lazarus. There was a mind drama before he got there. Three days, four days after Lazarus had been buried, Jesus said, our, brother, our friend Lazarus is sleeping. Let's go and wake him up. And the disciples said, no. The latest report that came said that he's dead and he's been buried. Master, we are not going because at this time, they are looking out to arrest you. And we've been hiding away. Was Jesus hiding because he was afraid of death? No. He was waiting for his death, but he wanted to die according to to the manner in which it was written. He didn't want to die differently. And there was a time into it. So he said, let's go. And the disciples said, well, if you are going, then we are going to die together because we know you will be arrested. When they got there, Martha came out. He said, he said to her, your brother will live. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Martha said, yes, on the resurrection, they say no. Mary came, said the same thing. They got to the grave. And when everybody was weeping, he touched his heart, broke his heart. Not for not knowing what to do. Not because he was frustrated. Jesus wept. It, it's natural when you see people you love weeping. You weep. And people said, this man could have come five days ago and stopped this man from dying. Now he's dead and buried. And Jesus told them, roll the stone away some disagreement and he was he spoke sternly roll the stone away immediately peter sprang to action and the whole place was filled with foul odor he says father i thank you because you hear me always but because of these ones that are saying i'm saying it loudly not that i do not i know you hear me but i have to say it loud because of them um, because of this Peter, James, and John, Mary, and Martha, who are yet to believe me totally. <laughs> Unbelieving believers. He said, therefore, Lazarus! Why was he shouting? The man was stuck down far beneath the earth. More than 14 kilometers away. Forth. People thought he had lost his mind. I look at him. He's been shouting. He's shouting. He's shouting. But something happened. There was movement. Bone to bone, flesh to flesh. Bound in grave clothes. And somebody was coming like that. Somebody was coming like that. Situation had changed. He had spoken. Never has his word been defied. Never has his word been defied. When he says, Rise up. They rise up. Now he has spoken. He said, lose him. Even the critics changed their minds. Some knelt and said, my Lord and my God. Some who are slow to believe said, let's be sure it's not his ghost. They went round and tried to touch him. And to be sure whether he was flesh and bone. They escorted him to the house. Ghosts don't eat. If they eat, they don't eat. 
they won't test him yet. Because they can't die. They know his days. They watch him eating. Then they went to the leaders and said, we have seen something today. And we are persuaded that what we saw is real. An eyewitness account said, I was at the grave when he was crying. And suddenly he stopped crying. He shouted and called the man. We thought he lost his mind. But the man came out. I held him. I saw him eating. And I tell you, including me, all of us have come to a conclusion that this man must be the Messiah, the Savior. In fact, let us tell you, leaders, we even now conclude that he's our God. Because from there, we began to worship him. Now, if you people know he is not God, if you know he's not the Savior, then do something now. Because the whole Israel will hear this. And before long, they will make him king. The enemies began to tremble. Caiaphas said, it is better for one man to die than for the whole nation to go down. He must die. He must die. What a fool he was. Somebody had just raised the dead after four days. Is that not enough lesson? To let you know that he is not a subject of death. And that death was rather his own subject. Anyway, they took him up. Arrested him. He went with them. When they put him in chains, they thought they were the ones that put him in chains. No, no. No. It was not their chains that bound him. He willingly gave his hands. Because he could have walked away. When they lacerated his body, he endured it patiently because he wanted to pay the required price for your healing. When they stripped him, it was your shame that he was bearing. The Lord said, there's somebody here that you have faced so much reproach and embarrassment that you are even avoiding your loved ones because of the shame. The Lord said that your shame has ended. that he will do a glorious thing in your life that they will come to celebrate you. The closest thing to that is Hannah. Did she become a celebrity thereafter? There's another person here. You have had a harvest of tragedies and misfortune. It has colored your life with bitterness. But the Lord said, your laughter has started. Amen. From today, you will begin to laugh. Amen. So the man was arrested. And they thought they were the ones that were arrested. But you see, once Jesus accepted that, accepted our sin and the sin of Adam, including your sin, will he qualify to die? The sin he was paying for was not his own sin. It was your sin and my sin. The sin of your father, the sin of my father. And so if he was carrying that sin, then we did not carry it anymore. If it was yours and he took it over, then it has become his own. But for you to get his righteousness, you must believe he took your sin. That's all God requires of you. Just agree that it was your sin you took. And if Jesus did not acquire sin, he couldn't have been arrested. He couldn't have died. It would be unlawful for him to die. Or that the scripture has failed. The soul that sinned, he shall die. So when they took him to the cross and nailed him, he became a cursed man. He never qualified for curses. It was your curse he took. So while on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Satan was celebrating that they've got him. Caiaphas was celebrating. The Pharisees were celebrating. Herod was celebrating. He said, we have gotten rid of him. When they pierced his side, the blood was shed. It was to make atonement for the sins. And after he had concluded the prize, then he said, it is finished. What finished? The 
remains. He did not die because he lost blood. He died because he willfully gave up, went out of the body. He did not die from the slow torture of death or crucifixion. No. He died because he willfully ejected himself from the body. The other thieves on the cross were yet to die. That's how they had to break their bones. But when they taught Jesus, they satisfied him dead. No, this one is not. Yet did he go to it. Of course. He acquired our sin. And he has died. So when they acquired the sin, what's the payment for sin? The soul that sin it, he shall die. Only blood can pay the price. So when he shed his precious blood, he paid for the sin he acquired. So by the time he was leaving the cross, the sin he had acquired from us had been paid for. When he was going down, he was going down without sin. He was going down as a champion. So when he stood before her, the first the gates opened. Why? Where was he going to? There was a prison that was under Satan's custody. All the righteous men that ever died awaiting the actual sacrifice which will only be done by the blood of Jesus Christ. They were held awaiting final judgment. So they had been held as prisoners there. Adam was there. Abraham was there. That's where the rich man saw Abraham. That's where Lazarus went in the story of Jesus Christ. Isaiah was there. David was there. So when Jesus Christ died, he was going there. He must go to the prison to release the prisoners there. Because he now has the evidence of the payment that what brought them essentially into prison, the debt had been paid. Now, he acquired the debt. So by acquiring their sin, they became free. But by paying with his blood, he also became free from what he acquired. With this evidence of his debt, of the blood that was shed, he could now go to the place and demand the release of those prisoners. He went in. Abraham recognized him because while Abraham was in the flesh, on one or two occasions they had met. That's why I said, Abraham saw me and rejoiced. And the foolish Jew said, how old are you? You don't even have gray hair. Abraham died long ago. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Before Abraham was, I am. They didn't understand. Who is this man that says before Abraham was, I am? Abraham recognized him. He was the major gatekeeper. He said, Abraham, I'm coming, I'm coming. He went straight to the back. The first to enter the place was Adam. And when Adam saw him, Adam recognized him. He said, my friend, you came all the way. Why did you call him friend? In the early days in the Garden of Eden, when God will come down to visit and they will have fellowship, he knew. He now showed his hand. He said, it is enough for a friend to lay down. Said, I have paid the price. Say, you mean you came all the way? Say, yes. I had to leave the throne. I have to come. Adam was in tears. He hugged him. He said, Where are your children? He said, These are the ones that have made it. He said, All right. We are going out now. We are going to the Father. We are going. There's a place prepared. And then there was earthquake and rumbling. And graves were open. According to Matthew 26 52. And you saw people in white robes that had died for a long time and they littered the streets of Jerusalem and the Jews were afraid the Pharisees were afraid Caiaphas trembled and they saw somebody that had just died three months ago another one that died two years ago and imagine that grandpa coming to the compound and they said grandpa where are you coming from he said the righteous man came he paid the price and released us from prison he says we should wait here for him he's coming back he has gone up is coming. So we are spending some days around just visiting and letting you know we are out of the prison. It was a terrible embarrassment. Go and read your scriptures very well. It was terrible embarrassment in Jerusalem because righteous men that had died were walking around. There was commotion. Yet, Caiaphas had in his heart. Yet, 
Pilate did not do anything about it. What are they going to do? Can they reverse the crucifixion? What had happened? Three days! Jesus was out of the grave. The bars were toiled, toiled away, and he came out. The soldiers were bribed not to say anything. They said, we saw him coming out. We saw him coming out. He came out with glory. Jesus said, I am flesh and bones. He walked the streets. He went to his disciples. He said, I'm going to the Father. I'm coming back. Don't touch me, he told Mary. He said, but I'll come back. Tell my brothers to wait for me in Galilee. Our meeting point. And they went to Galilee. He appeared to them. Once they were eating, the apostles, he came in and sat with them. And they saw him. I once said, I was not there. I will not believe. He said, don't worry. He came back for him. He said, bring your hands. Touch it. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He said, blessed are those who do not see, but they believe. He said, anyway, leave that alone. Now he appeared to them. He now told them their assignment, what he will do. And he said, he's going up. And on that day, he went up. Those witnesses that released from prison, they went with him. Listen to me. This is the great salvation. If you don't accept it, the reason why God subjected, to Jesus, subjected Jesus to such a torture, you will face it by yourself. God wants you to escape eternal punishment in hell. And don't think that we are just doing church. When your Bible expires, what do you do to it? You throw it into the trash. Where do you send the trash to? The trash man comes to collect it. Where does the trash man take it to? To the incinerator. I'm telling you, you may end up in the incinerator if you don't allow Jesus to take over your life. Now, why did he die? He died that we might be free from the condemnation of sin, from the guilt of sin that we have committed. Why did he suffer? He suffered that our sufferings might end. He received the stripes that we may be healed. He was stripped that we may no longer be naked became poor that we might be rich. He hung on the cross and was cursed that we might be redeemed from curses. Take advantage of this. God is not asking you to do any penance. He's only asking you to believe. Let us bow our heads. You want to take a conscious, make a conscious decision today that now I understand it. I really, really, really want to believe. I want to hand over my sin totally. I want the new life in Christ. I want to do the complete exchange. If you want me to pray for you, you are taking that decision. Please come out quickly. I'm going to pray for you in the next three minutes. Thank you. Just come out quickly. You want to take that decision that now you understand the purpose why Jesus came. And you want to say, look, I am taking advantage of it. I want that exchange. I want my sin taken. I want this righteousness. Then come out. Let me pray for you. Come quickly. Just come right to the front. I'm going to pray for you. That is why God brought you here. You want to do that exchange. Give him your sin and take his righteousness. Let him take your sin. You take over his righteousness. Thank you very much. Come please. You are coming quickly. Just make up your mind. You need to take his righteousness and hand over your sin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you are coming, come. Wise people make this decision. If you don't make this decision, you will lose this opportunity. You blame yourself. Take his righteousness today. Give him your sin. So I'm still waiting. I'll count up to four, and then I'll pray for these ones that have come. If you are coming, don't be, don't be, don't, don't be double-sided. You know you need to have his righteousness. Thank you for coming. One, if you are coming, please come quickly. You want his righteousness, and you want to give him your sin. You can't keep your sin and have his righteousness. You've got to give him your sin, then he takes your righteousness. Two, if you are coming, please come quickly. Let me pray for you this morning. Let me lead you in the prayer of exchange. Let me take you through that process and there will be an exchange done for you this morning. Three. I'm about to pray. Just think about it. You want to make that exchange this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Four. And like I promised, at the fifth count, I will start praying with them. You need to come. You want to make that exchange this morning. Don't be ashamed. Don't be shy. Don't be timid. Just come. I will pray. I will pray for you. I will pray with you. And five. Now, say after me, those of you who are here, I want to congratulate you because you took a noble decision. Say with me, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for coming down to earth to take my sins and to give me your righteousness. I stand out here today. I make a conscious decision. 
I hand over my sin to you. Forgive me, Lord. Give me a new life. I want your righteousness. I want your life. I want your power. I want your goodness. I am tired of failure, of disappointment. I am tired of sin. I want righteousness. Thank you for making your righteousness available for me. I believe you are the son of God. You died for my sin. You rose from the dead. I make you Lord in my life. I am no longer a slave. I am now a child. I am God's heir. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the exchange. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the love. Thank you. From today, I receive the right of sonship, the power to be the child of God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you. Lord, the exchange is done. Because they have what they have said. They have handed over their sins and you have handed them your righteousness. I declare you forgiven. I declare you righteous. I declare that it is done. From today, you will enjoy the benefits of sonship. Glory be to God. In Jesus' name we pray. Give a clap offering to the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. You may be seated. In the same vein, he wants to take your sickness and give you his own health. He wants to take sickness from you and give you healing. In Matthew 8, 17, can you put it on the screen for me? Matthew 8, 16 and 17. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the devils with his word and healed all that were sick. Can we read it together? One, two, go. When the evening was come. How many were healed? No, some. Now, by that scripture, there is an implication there. That there's a relationship between presence of devils and sicknesses. Now, 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 this is not science. Now, forget about university learning. Please forgive me. This is not pharmacy. This is not medical science. This is not chemistry. This is not biology. This is scripture logic. You understand what I'm saying now? This is Bible logic. So this is a new world of learning. It's different from what you went to in university. University can handle this. So pay attention. Jesus healed all that were sick, but before the healing, he cast out the spirit with his word. Which means, the departure, or the dislodging of the spirit led to the healing. And not some were healed, but all. So I'm going to do that this morning. I'll cast out the spirit that are responsible for your affliction. Amen. Let me hear another amen. amen. Another amen. amen. And then you'll be healed. I'll give you two examples. I pray I don't go more than two. There was this woman that had a child. She just delivered. And you know, she will keep on having blood flow for some days, maybe seven days, eight days. And after that, it just fizzles out. Now, after eight days, it didn't stop. Two weeks, she was becoming anemic. So they went to the hospital. They did everything. They couldn't arrest the situation. It was getting to one month. So it was getting bad. So they brought that to me. I, I, I still remember it vividly. That must be somewhere around 1983, 84. So I said, okay, I'll pray for you. I prayed. And nothing happened. I just said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. I took like a natural thing. And it didn't stop. He came back the next day. I said, Lord, so what happened? And the Lord showed me that It's an evil spirit like a strange creature punctures her system and the blood flows again. So when they try to arrest it and it's stopping, another hit. So I said, okay, come over. I didn't tell her this. See, in the name of Yeshua's strange spirit, 
I just drained this woman's blood and I arrest you. Get out! And that was all. I didn't need to pray for healing. It stopped permanently. There was another young girl that had what they said was appendicitis. And uh, the father is a medical doctor and had the best private hospital in that city. The mother is a nurse. And so they did all their checking. And once they are trying to take her to theater, situations will change. So they get her out again. They will do all the checks. Once it comes up, and once it comes up, she will just be bowed together like that. She won't be able to stand upright, and she'll be in pain. That's how she will go to bed. She will not walk upright. So I became bothered about it. And I said, Lord, why will this little girl suffer this much? And then I saw in a vision that something was tied on her waist. Like a rope. And I found there was a strange creature that accompanied her. And whenever he pulled it, it like tightened the loops. And whenever the thing, then the pain will start and then she will go down. Until he relaxes it at his own will. So I said, okay. So I told the mother, when next she starts having this affliction, wherever I am, get me quickly. She did. So as soon as I got to the house, I said, get out, get out. And then she came like that. So I said, all right. As she was coming out and in pain, groaning, so I also bowed. So I held her by the waist. Where I saw that strength of the hold, hold it as in the name of Jesus, I lose her. Get up! She stood up. I hit her and said, this thing will never come back again. From that day, it's over 20 years. It had never come back. Listen to me. He cast out the spirit with his word and heal all that were sick. Verse 17. That he might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, that himself took my infirmities and bore the way he took my sin. That's what I told you. He took your sin to give you righteousness. The same way he took when did he take our infirmities? When his body was lacerated when they flogged him. That's why they said, by his stripes. Literally translated from our language, say the beating, the flogging that brought our help was upon him by his stripes. By the stripes he received, we are healed. Now, all it requires is for you to believe that he suffered those stripes that you may be healed. Now, the choice is yours. Unfortunately, I can't really believe for you. Because your heart is not my heart. If I believe the healing anointing comes to me, it's like you asking me to eat your lunch so that you can be satisfied. What will happen if I eat your lunch for you? <laughs> You remain hungry. Tell yourself, I'm ready to believe. If I say I change my mind, say I change my mind. I've decided to believe. Look, you don't lose anything by believing that Jesus Christ took your sickness the way he took your sin. So why do you want to waste your time not believing? I've not asked you to give me a thousand dollars. I've only asked you, accept, agree that the same way he took your sin, so that you will not go to hell again. He took that sickness. Is there any agreement? You agree? Then you have your healing. The process is simple. You will say, Lord Jesus, I hand over this sickness and I receive healing from you. And when you say I receive healing, then you are receiving. You must say, if you don't say it, you are not receiving. You say, I receive healing. And then when you say, I am healed, then it's actualized. Because Jesus said, you will have what you say. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe with all my heart. The same way you took my sin, you took my sickness. Just the same way you took my sin. Upon yourself, you took my sickness. In the same way, you took my poverty. In the same way, you took my failure. 
In the same way, you took my sorrow. In the same way, you took my disabilities. You gave me your righteousness. You gave me your health. You gave me your victory. You gave me your power. You gave me your glory. You took the curses. And you gave me your blessing. Lord Jesus, I take over that which you have given me. I receive my righteousness. I receive my healing. I receive my victory. I receive my blessing. I receive my glory. In the name of Jesus. Satan, leave me alone. Pack your Lord and go. Take your dirty hands off me. Take your dirty hands off my business. Take your dirty hands off my family. Take your dirty hands off my marriage. In the name of Jesus, I am free from your hold. I am free from your dominion. I am free from sin. I am free from sickness. I am free from poverty. In the name of Jesus, I am free. Go ahead and praise him. Go ahead and praise him. Praise him. Because you are free. Honor him. Exalt his holy name. Magnify him. Celebrate your freedom. Celebrate your freedom. Please celebrate your freedom now. You are free. He by the grace of God tested death for all men. He tested death. He gave his life a ransom. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Lord, I give you praise. In Jesus' name. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you reign in my life. I'm so glad you came. You came from her good to her to show. From the earth to the cross, my death and you pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the star, Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven. Lord Jesus, thank you very much for what you've done for us. Thank you for coming to the cross. Thank you for going to the cross for us. We praise you. Today, I declare that everything that Satan has stolen from your children be restored in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Give a clap offering to the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to lay hands. We are going to lay hands. I will be working through the weekend. God has been wonderful. God has done wonderfully with us. Those of you who came for sorting out.
sorry, I have some of my senior pastors with me. Pastor Bayoku is there from Lagos. He's the senior pastor that holds up our work in the Lagos territory and the whole Southwest. And then I had to bring him on this trip because, you know, certain out is very demanding. We have to see everybody one on one. Uh, Pastor Gabriel, he came also from the UK. And, uh, he coordinates the entire work we do in the UK. And uh, I just believe in God that we'll be able to do more. It's just that God has not extended the team beyond 24 hours and 365 days in a year. So that's the problem I have with Pastor Joseph Tako, who wants me to spend one month here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and um, we are going to lay hands. The, the city of lay hands is very simple. Yes, Pastor. You are afraid. <laughs> Pastor, how are you? How are you? What's your name? Good name. How are you doing? <laughs> She's embarrassing me. She doesn't know where I'm going to. Now, I just greeted you, but you can change that and touch my hand with the meaning. And the meaning can be that I want this power. You know, the, you remember, you remember the woman with the issue of blood? She said, I'm going to touch that man's dress. She added a purpose. She said, I know once I touch him, he will be healed. The truth is that whenever <coughs> we lay hands with the intention of healing, healing happens. Because the meaning of that laying on of hands is transfer of healing virtue. And it's Jesus Christ that said, you will lay hand on the sick. The sick shall recover. After speaking that word, the word took effect. Because once he speaks, it is done. Now, Dimpe, say, I want some of the power you are carrying. <laughs> you see, you see, her face has changed. Now she's she's no longer embarrassed. What will you do with the power? <laughs> now I lift up the other hand. Say, Lord, I make contact. I truly want some of this power. Thank you for choosing me. I don't know why your servant called me. You have a purpose in my life. I receive this power. Say it with your heart. Say it. Thank you, Jesus. Receive the power. And you have it. From now you will lay hands. And the sick will be healed. Now you see, once you add meaning to what you are receiving, it happens. Those of you who want to be healed, just line up here. Ushers, take charge. We are going to lay hands. We have less than 30 minutes to do this laying on of hands. So your faith better be sharp. Now, don't make two lines. Only one line. The rest will wait until this key is gone. Did you hear me? I don't want a second line. It will save us some confusion. Now, let me also tell you how to receive. You receive with your heart through your mouth. I receive, I receive with my heart through my mouth. Why? Jesus said you believe in your heart and you say it with your mouth, then you have what you say. Did you hear that? You know, this is not university now, this is church. So I'm telling you how the master said. So once you believe, do you agree that you are 
getting healed now. So you now say, I receive my healing. Now, you understand? When you say, I receive my healing, you agree in your heart and say it convincingly. Who are you convincing yourself? Say, I am receiving my healing. Or maybe what do you want what do you want to be healed of? Okay, lift up your hands. Say I am receiving my healing now. No, no, I'm dealing with that. Say from my head to my toes. I am free from this blood pressure and arthritis. Jesus! Shout his name! Jesus! Thank you, Lord. Drop your hands. Say thank you, Jesus. Now look at me. Touch your face. Up. Was it your knee, your hand, your wrist, your waist? Which of them? You know where it was the waist? Mom. All right. So, okay. Let's prove the waist first. Put your hands on your waist. Turn. Do it. Look for the hook. Look for it. Do it very well. Then look at me again. Do like this. Up. Just do as I do. Up. Open your legs again. Then move your wrist. Move it. Discomfort it. It will never come back again. So it is so simple by just saying I receive it. Hey, that's what he said. He said you will have what you say. How many of you are ready to receive? Start laying hands there. Start laying hands there. As they lay hands on you, say, I receive my healing. And then do what you are not able to do. Please do it very fast. We have very few minutes to spend. We can't, we have, we have less than 30 minutes to be here. In the name of Jesus. What do you want to be healed of? Okay, lift up your hands. Do you want it to disappear? There will be some, if something like fire to burn it off. Jesus. When I touch you, you shout Jesus. One, two. Jesus. Shout! Jesus. That's all. What about you? You said. Once they have taught you, you can go. Receive my healing and then exercise yourself. 